Services, and I'd like to extend our gratitude to our program sponsors. Please join me in thanking all of those on our sponsor slide. Get up. This is my sponsor. There's supposed to be a list, and we will get that. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank Arkansas PBS for their partnership in making this afternoon's program accessible to those tuning in from home and remotely via live stream. We are grateful to have your support and those of so many other efforts uh, to extend the impact of this exhibition and our mission. This exhibition is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see rare original print of the U.S. Constitution, along with original examples of the Declaration of Independence, the proposed Bill of Rights, the Articles of Confederation, and the 13th Amendment and Emancipation Proclamation. These historic documents are displayed in conversation with works of art by influential historical and contemporary artists who provide diverse American perspectives on the nation's founding principles. More than pieces of paper seen behind glass on a field trip, these documents remain essential to our lives today and deeply relevant, and we find new ways to connect with them through the eyes of artists. We are thrilled to have programs such as today's with leading scholars, artists, and thought leaders from around the nation, centered on key ideas from our nation's foundational documents that continue to inform and inspire us today. Please plan to join us at the many upcoming events like this one throughout the fall. And now some logistics. Uh, during the program, uh, you will be able to scan a QR code on the screen to be able to pose a question for our Q&A session after the conversation. You simply open your camera app, point it at the screen, and it will take you directly to our online form where you can submit a, a question at any time during the conversation, and we'll select a few at the end of the talk. Now I'm pleased to introduce our special guests. Guiding us through our conversation this afternoon, we welcome David Rubenstein. David is co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlisle Group, one of the world's largest and most successful private investment firms. David serves as chairman of the boards of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the National Gallery of Art, the National Constitution Center, and a director of the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, among many others. He is also a leader in the area of patriotic philanthropy, having made transformative gifts to the restoration or repair of the Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, Monticello, Montpelier, Mount Vernon, Arlington House, the Iwo Jima Memorial, the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, the National Zoo, the Library of Congress, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. David talks about these projects and his work on, is the host of the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations on Bloomberg TV and PBS, and has recently published two books, American Story Conversations with Master Historians, published in October 2019, and The American Experiment, Dialogues on a Dream, published in September 2021. Joining David in conversation are three changemaker artists. First, I'll introduce Luis C. Garza. Luis began his artistic career as a photojournalist, recording the tumultuous social events of the 1960s and 70s for La Raza magazine, the journalistic voice of the Chicano movement in Los Angeles. His images captured the attention of many and later led to his multifaceted career in documenting production, arts marketing, event coordination, arts consulting, and exhibition curation. Bethany Collins lives and works in Chicago, Illinois, and she received her MFA from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, and a BA from the University of, Atlanta, of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. A native of Montgomery, Bethany has been exhibited across the country and most recently, among a few other projects, at Crystal Bridges with a sonic installation of America, a hymnal, She's had solo exhibitions at the Frist Art Museum in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, My Destiny in Your Hands at Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, and Cadence uh, in 2022 at Patron Gallery in Chicago. Her work is included in the public collections of the St. Louis Art Museum, the Block Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Peabody Essex Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, among others. Sandow Burke is based in Los Angeles and is a well-traveled graduate of the Otis Parsons Art Institute. 
Frequently developed as expansive multimedia projects, his works have dealt with contemporary life in its entirety. With an emphasis on social issues, frequent themes of his past work have included urban violence, graffiti, political issues, travel, war, and prisons, as well as surfing and skateboarding. He's the recipient of numerous awards from the National Endowment of the Arts to a Fulbright Fellowship, Getty Fellowships, and also awards from the City of Los, An City of Los Angeles. He's been an artist in residence for the Smithsonian Institute and at the Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris in 2008. But most recently, he is working on projects involving a consideration of the Quran as relevant to contemporary life in America. Please join me in welcoming David, Louise, Bethany, and Sandow to the stage to talk about their work and what it means to change, be a change maker artist. the only non-artist here with this suit on. <laughs> I only have business suits. I'm amortizing them all. So. Um, how many people have never been to uh, Crystal Bridges before? Anybody? Wow. All right. How many people have been at least once? How many people are from Arkansas? How many people from outside of Arkansas? Okay. How many people from outside the United States? Anybody? Oh, wow. Okay. All right. How many people are happy that they came here today? <laughs> All right, so let's have a conversation about your unique works of art. Um, Louise, why don't we start with you? Um, I notice you carry that camera with you everywhere you go. Um, so, you know, is that a habit? Or when did you start carrying that camera? I started carrying this camera from the very beginning when I first picked up a camera in 1967, 60, yeah, 67, 68. I started with a Brownie Kodak camera, very simple camera, then to a Pentax, then to a Nikon, Hasselblad, and now Canon Digital. Most of my work is in analog, but now I'm marrying the two between analog and digital, the wonderful world. But this camera is my razón de ser, my reason for being. This camera makes me who I am. So how many uh, photographs do you take a week? Oh, I can number in uh, tens of Tens of tens and hundreds. Uh, I have an exhibit. I have a collection of over thou eight thousand images that have yet to be digitized. Where do you keep those? In files at my house. And okay. uh, and uh, suppose you walked around with an iPhone camera. Would that be not as good? Or <laughs> well, that's my secondary camera that I carry. <laughs> Thank you, Apple. I <laughs> so is that the the camera you have? The main camera. That's. Ten times better than an iPhone camera? Five times? Three Not times? Not necessarily. The technology in digital has advanced so much that the, the capture image is phenomenal, especially the new uh, cameras, um, as attested by so many friends who right. carry the uh, Apple. Right. You grew up in the South Bronx. Born and raised. And did you say, I want to be a photographer when you were growing up? No. What did you want to be? I had no idea. I had no idea until I arrived in Los Angeles in the mid-60s, uh, 1965, and um, I was introduced to a gentleman who flipped my worldview and introduced me into the Chicano movement. I was a student, I was broke, I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing, but I had picked up a camera and I began photographing. And he said to me, you take pictures? And I said, yes. And he said, all right, and you're not Puerto Rican? I go. Uh, no. Uh, yes, I am. By osmosis. I'm Irish. I'm Jewish. I'm Italian. I'm Boricua. Uh, but a Chicano from New York, that was very different because there are no Chicanos from New York. So I adapted and I said, yeah, I'm a Chicano from New York. He gave me the job okay. and he said, you're going to start organizing the people. All right. And um, so you, had you ever heard of the word Chicano before? No, that was a strange thing, because when he said to me, a Chicano from New York, and I thought to myself, Chicano, Mexicano, 
close enough. I said, yeah, I'm a Chicano from New York, right? <laughs> and, so you, and so you started photographing some of the riots. Um, um, yeah, well, he introduced me into the Chicano movement, La Raza magazine, and the beginnings of the civil rights movement of Mexican-American, of the Chicano movement within Los Angeles and then the Southwest. And that gave me an introduction and led me to begin a photographic career that entered into documentary filmmaking, theater, arts organizations, etc. That was my entree. So this camera gave me the world of art as I never knew it. And I notice sometimes photographers have these lenses that are like this big. Yeah. Why, why do they need that, that big? You don't have that. <coughs> no. Well, it's in the eye of the photographer and the type of photography that they're doing. Uh, you can capture a powerful image with a Kodak camera as well as you can with a long lens. It all depends on the eye of the photographer. Let me ask you a question about cameras. I, I'm not a photographer. I don't have that skill set. But in most areas of technology, the Japanese have been bypassed by lots of different other countries, the Chinese, rather. Why is it that the best or most common high-use cameras are still made by the Japanese? Sony, Nikon, Canon, why is that? I guess that evolves after World War II and they began to get into technology. But, but it was the Germans and the Swiss with the cameras uh, that began with uh, Zeiss lens and, and uh, other uh, cameras from German and Swedish manufacturers. Uh, so I guess Japanese just evolved after World War II in particular with all kinds of product that, uh, that was their entree into the global market. If I said I wanted to be a photographer but I don't have any skill set, how long would it take me to actually learn how to do what you do? Uh, <laughs> Well, it's only taken me 50 years to get to this point here. Okay, so, so 50 years, more or less. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Bethany, let me ask you. Um, <laughs> you focus on, uh, a, I would say, a somewhat narrow area, which is uh, things that are, um, say, race-related and also things that deal with the word. Is that right, the human word, the spoken word, the written word? So how did you get into the, those two categories? Ooh. Uh, so all the work is language-based. Um, it's a way for, Maggie Nelson calls this like leaning on the language of others. I need the language of others in order to make sense of okay. the world. So I love a good archive. You can give me like a dictionary from the 1980s, um, which is the year they had the most controversial dictionary of all of American history. It was like New York Times articles written about the controversy. Um, I feel like there's nothing, I know that there's nothing you can't know about a people from an archive of our language. Okay. So most people wouldn't say that a dictionary is a work of art, mm -hmm. but you've made the use of a dictionary into a work of art. Can you explain that? I did. It's one of my least favorite works because it took forever. It's the work that I still hate. It's um, colorblind dictionary. It's good, colorblind dictionary, but it took me a year to erase all of the color from the text. It was a super laborious process of reading the entire dictionary. The one that came after that was black and blue dictionary. So I was only looking for the terms black and blue. What's interesting about that, it's, you know, it becomes a very, all of the work is very process based. It, it is intentionally laborious, but it's surprising where color will show up and then there will be pages and pages and chapters okay. without. One thing I guess you might like butter is my country tis a day. What, what did you do relating to that? One of the first works I made after the 2016 presidential election was America Hymnal. So it is an artist book that consists of a hundred versions of My Country Tis a Bee. So this used to be a much more common early American practice where you would keep the melody of a well-known song, keep that really consistent, but then you rewrite the lyrics for different social political causes. So My Country Tis a Bee, The Star Spangled Banner, Dixie as well. Um, those lyrics that we know keep the melody, but they're rewritten for suffrage, temperance, prohibition. The Confederacy has their version, as do abolitionists and the Union Army. And so I bound a hundred of those versions together so that they, they could not escape one another. They forever must abide one another in opposition. Now, uh, Leonardo used to get paintings by commission. He would get commissioned and he would paint something. 
Uh, do artists today like you, do you wait for somebody to call you up and commission something, or do you just say, I have an idea, I'm going to do it, maybe I can sell it to somebody, or I just won't sell it, I'll just keep it? How do you work? I work from, like, I mean, that hymnal work is based on that kind of realization of the fragility of democracy after the 2016 presidential election and a feeling of a kind of betrayal of one's country, love of and also betrayal, and wanting to make sense of that moment. And so binding those versions together for me was a way to re, it's like, oh, and we've never always agreed. We have rarely been in, in a kind of 100% unanimity, right? A, so a unanimous kind of song. By so I word, make the work in order to make, to make work, sense of the you world. You talk to somebody and you're like a gallery and they say, well, maybe they'll sell it, maybe that. Or do you wait for somebody to call you and say, I'd like something like this, and you do it? You know, when you wait for people to call you, they usually have a lot of opinions about what they want you to make. <laughs> so you, you just keep making. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, and now, you are, can, can you explain, you have an unusual first name. Yeah. I, I don't know that many people with a first name, Sandow. Uh, where did you get that name from, other than your parents? But where did they get it from? Uh, it was my mother's last name, and she was a, a family of all women, so when siblings died, there would be no one with that name. Okay. Did you ever ask her when you were a little boy, an unusual first name? No. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when you were growing up in Southern California, you were a surfer boy. Yeah, I still am. <laughs> and and uh, so you were surfing all the time. Are there a lot of surfers who turn out to be great artists? <laughs> uh, great? I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's more than you would think. I mean, surfing's pretty uh, common activity in, in, in California, and most of my friends are artists. Many of them. Okay. Are you specialize in a number of different areas, but they are, uh, I'll let you describe it, but you've done things that are quite unique. For example, take the uh, English language version of the Koran, yeah. and then paint or illustrate 240-some pages yeah. of it. Why did you think the world needed a illustrated English version of the Koran with modern painting, or modern, modern uh, illustrations in it? Uh, it's not a short answer, but the, uh, the project I did before that was all about the war in Iraq, when the war in Iraq was going on, which I was very much against when George Bush was president. And then I spent many years engaged with the war in Iraq and eventually, you know, listening to the radio and people discussing after 9-11, oh, you know, Islam is at war with Western civilization, it's a violent religion, it's incompatible and all these things. And I started to think, you know, as a surfer, I do a lot of traveling to go surfing and I started counting like how many times I had been to Islamic countries and I think it was 10 or 11 times on, to go surfing. And I said, you know, I've been to Islamic countries, and I've had fantastic time and made wonderful friends and eaten amazing food. And rather, I said, this isn't the way that I've experienced Islam. So I went to the bookstore and bought the Quran, and I started reading it. And it was just, you know, the first impression was it was remarkably similar to everything we knew. And I said, more Americans should read the Quran. Okay, but it took you nine years to do that. That wasn't intentional. <laughs> uh, did you do, were, you, were you doing other works of art during that nine-year period of time, or? Yeah. Uh, did you support I, yourself I, waiting for nine-year work of art to be completed? Well, the only way I make money is doing art shows. So uh, I thought it would take me four years. And I work with several galleries around the US. And uh, the way we would do it is I would finish like 40 <coughs> pages, and we would have a show. And then I'd do another 40 pages and have a show. So it was kind of ongoing. Okay. So there's a work of art that I just saw here that you did where you have the uh, Constitution and you have the, you wrote out every single word in the Constitution in very, very small script. Um, suppose you made a mistake. What do you do when you're writing something and then you <laughs> make a mistake? Do you write it out or you have to start all over again? How does that work? You use white out. You white out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever make a mistake? I've made a lot of mistakes. I'm, I still make mistakes. Really? I'm, I'm, I'm bad with the typos. <laughs> so how does it work with, uh, all right, so that work of art, there are, um, is it 20, you made 25 or 50 of them? Yeah, that's an etching. It's a etching, copper plate right, etching. Etchings. Okay, so do you, you do 50 of them? Uh, no, I think 20. Or 20, Maybe. okay. So to make that work economically, since you have to, you know, make a living, um, you have an, uh, a gallery that, that sells them for you, is that what you do? 
Yeah, I basically work with the gallery in LA and San Francisco and New York, and then I sort of rotate shows. And when uh, I did that image, uh, I started working with a printmaker in, in uh, San Francisco. Okay. So explain this to me. Um, it's always a balance between if you make 500 of something, yeah. and you can sell it for a lower price and you might get more money, but if you make a fewer number of them, you can sell it for a higher price, but you might like less money. So how do you decide how many prints you're going to have? Well, 500 is, is basically a poster printed on like a, okay, a, so it's not a commercial many. machine, and these are etchings that were done on copper plates that were all done all by hand and run through the machine, glued together. I think it's uh, nine different pieces of paper that are glued together. So it's super labor intensive, and the the, the workshop who did it, I mean, they had like four people working on it for like six months. They couldn't, that's all they could make. So uh, if you're an artist, like type you are, do you get up in the morning and go surfing and then you come back and you say, I'm going to do an hour of art today and then I'll read the newspapers, watch television, or do you do eight hours of during the day? How much can you do during the day before you say I've had enough? Uh, I work seven days a week. I usually work like four or five hours a day. Five hours a day is good. It seems more than that. You know, I work alone. I'm usually just standing up and painting, and you get hard to stand up five hours a day and concentrate. You ever thought of hard. getting a chair or something like that? <laughs> it doesn't doesn't really work because the paintings are large. You have to walk around, listen to the radio. Okay, and your studio is immaculate and neat, or is that what the artist studios are? It's, it's pretty neat. I live in a, a loft with my family, with two kids and my wife, and uh, so about half of it's a workspace, and the other half is. And your kids don't get into the they hard work area. It's tough. I mean, they're they're older now. They're eight and twelve. But when they were like three, they would be running around in between. And but there was like areas like they weren't allowed to touch anything. Okay. <laughs> like no toxic chemicals in the house, stuff like. That. Okay. So, um, Stephanie, how do you do this? Do you get up eight in the morning and work eight hours a day or five hours a day? How do you decide to do? How much I work wish you I could do a sleep till eight. Um, um, I work from at my own hours. Um, I work from like a nine to five, except on my teaching days, which I usually block off on one day of the week. And then I try not to think about students the rest of the week, and I'm just in the studio. Okay, and you're teaching now at the University of Chicago? I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do students ask the question I always used to ask, uh, is this going to be on the exam? Do you ever get that? The, I think students are much more these days, I think they're much more concerned with doing it right. And so in, in an art class, especially a studio class, like drawing is what I typically teach, you have to fail quite a lot before you right. like make the right mark. It's hard for them. So um, if you have an art student in your class, um, is it hard to say to that person, you really don't have any talent <laughs> and you really shouldn't be an artist or you just <laughs> encourage them to keep doing more and more? I'm not teaching, I think we're not making, let's see, it is a very rare um, ability and it's a very rare profession to be able to live as an artist, but that doesn't mean that the class doesn't have any like other kind of benefits. How do you make sense of cultural moments? How do you participate as a maker, as a recipient, as an audience, as a reviewer? There's a lot of ways to participate in the arts beyond just being the maker of it. And I. I think my students are becoming geared towards that. Quite okay. a few of them. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, let me ask you, uh, if you had to do it all over again, would you do a different profession? No. 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 I, I wake up every day, I'm just happy that I can. Really? Eat. You wouldn't want to be in something important like private equity? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really happy. Okay, Louise. <laughs> um, so, um, in, in taking, you've made photography and art. In other words, people used to think of photos as something that could illustrate something. They didn't think of it as a kind of a art form in quite the way that it is now. So when you're doing your, your um, photos now, do you view it as a form of art, or did it take a while for people to um, kind of see what you're doing as art? Combination of both. Um, the, the, art, uh, the artist within is an evolving process. Um, I did not know I was an artist until I picked up the camera. The camera made me become an artist because to master the technical aspects of your choice of trade is a skill set, it's a passion that you have to dive into. 
in order to evolve as an artist. And so this camera has been my mentor, as I've had many other physical mentors in my life. Now, a famous uh, photographer who many people consider to be, as I do, an artist, as well as Ansel Adams. Yes. So what did he actually do that was so unique that made him so famous? But he, did he just get better scenery, or did he have a better camera than other people, or did he know how to develop the photos better than other people? What did he do that was so unique? A combination of both, but most of his work is landscape that he's known for, and incredible vistas of the American West. And, uh, so, and he developed and printed his own work, uh, which becomes even uh, more rare and makes it very exceptional, as we now know of his work. To be in this exhibition here with the likes of Gordon Parks and uh, Elizabeth Catlett and my contemporaries here, uh, past and present for me is such an honor. Uh, I have never had my work acquired by a museum until Crystal Bridges acquired my work. So for me, it really is an honor. Uh, um, if no one ever had acquired it before, how did you know how to set the price? I didn't. I didn't. For a long time, uh, <laughs> I would sell my work for whatever I can get. Uh, I did not have a name. I, I'm only five minutes into that 15 minutes of fame that people speak about. Okay. All right, so let me ask you, in the old days, photographers used to have to put film in, mm -hmm. and then some of the photographers, as you suggested with Ansel Adams, actually would develop the print itself. Yes. Today, everything is pretty much digital. You're not developing these. these are, this is all digital, is that right? Yes. With this camera, it's digital. I still do uh, analog, and I have a, a photo lab in uh, LA that does my work, uh, which is what is here hanging on the walls of this okay. exhibition. But what photographers used to do is I thought that there was a skill set in developing the, the photo in the, the dark room or something. But is that skill set going away with digital? Uh, no, uh, very much so. I mean, that's where I began inside the darkroom. To become a, a, a photographer, photographing is the first half. Darkroom work is the second half. You bring that together and you develop an eye for composition, for framing, for cropping. It makes you a better photographer. Whether When you pick up a digital, it's no different. You still have to compose. You still have to frame. You still have to see the subject matter in order to capture that moment that stands out above all. But you have to take a thousand shots before you get that one shot that means something, that has any kind of okay. meaning. So if you go to a dinner party, do you show up with a camera around you, or you don't do that? Do uh, sometimes I do. And the people, what, do they, what do the hosts say? They say, you're not going to take pictures of my house, are you, or something like uh, that? Not unless they're wanted by the police. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, in your case, uh, you do a lot of photographs of historic related events. So like when you were photographing the student protests in uh, the Chicanos when you first started, mm -hmm. they, those became very historic after a while. They did, and they are becoming even more so now, especially since uh, we had the La Raza exhibition of uh, the newspaper archives of over 30,000 images at the Orchard Museum in Los Angeles. And so that exhibition was the king tut of kind of photography. It presented photography from our point of view, from our sensibility in a manner that had not been done before. However, my photography in particular is not only the Chicano student movement or the activist or the civil rights movement, but I cross into New York, I cross into Europe, I cross into Budapest, Hungary, where I photograph David Alfaro Siqueiros, the Mexican muralist. So my work is international in scope. So if you want to uh, uh, photograph somebody, do you have to go ask them uh, permission? Can I photograph you? Or what do you just do? Just in go take pictures? In some cases. In most cases, it's very instantaneous. It's a one shot. Uh, or if not, it becomes a roll of film or two rolls of film because the subject matter and I begin to really gel. And other times, you, you got to take a shot as fast as you can, particularly during demonstrations and those activist sceneries where you don't have time to compose. You have to take it on the fly. So you have to be quick. Your sensibilities have to be agile. Well, suppose, suppose you're at a protest and you're taking photos, and then you ever have that problem if somebody hits you or come up to you and say, I don't want photographs, they push you to the ground? That happens. That happens? That happens, yeah. It happens with the LAPD, the Sheriff's Department, 
Uh, it happens with individuals. It happens with people who don't take my photograph. Uh, or why are you taking my photograph? And others who just begin to strike a pose, as Madonna totally would say. Well, if the LAPD says, don't take a picture, what do you do? I still take a picture of them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you have um, others in your family that are interested in photography? No, no. Um, my family is a very humble beginning from Nava, Coahuila, Mexico, and South Texas, who migrated to New York in the 1920s. Um, they were blue-collar workers. My mother and father were just blue-collar workers. It was a small colonia of Mexicanos from my mother's and father's side in New York. Um, I grew up in a... Uh, inside the house, it was Mexican. Outside, it was everybody else. So when I came out to Los Angeles in the mid-60s into a community of Mexicans, there were so many Mexicans, I had never seen so many Mexicans in my life. <laughs> and so I gravitated to that, and I became enmeshed not only with Chicanos, but with Latinos in general and a whole mixture of people. What were your parents doing in New York? Didn't they know they were supposed to be in California or something like that? No, 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 no. They, they, they took a boat, a coastal ferry out of Galveston, Texas in 1920 and hugged the coast and came up to New York City. That's how my family began. There was no interstate highway. There was no railway system. So it was a coastal ferry up to New York in the 1920s. And did your parents live to see how you became pretty prominent in the photography world? No. Uh, well, my father saw a photograph of me with a camera around my neck, standing over a dead body in one of the demonstrations. And my father sent me the picture from the New York Post and from a Mexican journal and said, Mijo, what are you doing? What's this about? And he said, esto no es juego. This is no game. Be careful. And shortly after my father passed away. Um, but that was the only time that my father realized, or my mother realized, that I was involved within the Chicano movement and the activism that I was beginning to take on. What does democracy mean to you? Democracy means to me exactly what we are going through in this country right now. It's a trickle-down, very selective process as how democracy applies to various ethnic cultural groups within this country. So it's not a stand by for everybody. It's not for everyone. If you look at that history of voting and access by women, by indigenous people, by, uh, by any number of groups, it's a trickle down process. Now, um, Bethany, uh, your parents inspired you to go into the art world? My dad can fix anything, and if he can't, he'll watch a YouTube video and then call you back and tell you how to fix it. And I think that's a, a tremendous amount of creativity. My mom, um, I think she calls herself a Sunday painter, so she's so she was a painter. very creative. Yes, they're and both creative. Your father was a Mr. Fix-It. He could fix anything. Anything. So <laughs> you call him up and you say, I broke something, and he I did fix yesterday. It. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> so um, when you're thinking of new subjects to create works of art about, how long does it take you to do that? Do you take you a week to think of something, a day, a month? Uh, how long does it take to come up with a new subject? Well, I knew I wanted to make a work about homeland, and like not recognizing your, the place that you're from. And so I was listening to a lot of podcasts, doing a lot of reading, and then I came across a New Yorker article. It was about Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey. She's the first woman to translate the Odyssey into English in 2017. And I, I knew I had to work. It takes a lot of reading and just research before the, the idea is set. But her translation gave me an entire new body of work to make. So today, do you have a gallery that exhibits your works? Where is that? Chicago, Patron Gallery. Okay. And do you ever um, go to the gallery and try to talk people into buying the stuff, or you don't do that? No. You don't do that. That's not appropriate. <laughs> they just, they, they they just, just love it, David. They, they just okay. love it. <laughs> And um, you are biracial. I am. So does that influence your works of art? A lot of your um, works of art relate to race? A lot of the work relates to American history, racial, national identities. But it's also, you know, that sense of, my sense of growing up in the South, so I'm originally from Montgomery, Alabama, is a kind of, the South is beautiful and it's frightening. And that landscape holds this kind of dual history. It is always a beautiful sight, and it is always a sight of terror at the same time. Do you have siblings who are artists? Or? No. 
lawyer, teacher, no. Important things like lawyers. Other <laughs> important things, okay. yes. <laughs> Sandy, let me ask you, you um, came up with the idea of painting the state prisons in California. Yeah, I did, yeah. Why did you want to do that? Oh, I, uh, most of the work I do is based on other artworks from the past. I really love uh, art history, so uh, I was really interested in American landscape painting because it's sort of, it's like a side road of American history, like 18th century landscape painting. So I was reading all these books about a, like Albert Beardstadt and Thomas Moran and that kind of stuff. And then I was driving in my car and on the radio they mentioned that California had the highest percentage of its population in prison of anywhere in the world. And that sentence just like struck me as I was thinking about the American West and these landscape paintings, how beautiful it was and about how the idea of, you know, it used to be that you'd go west, go to California, strike it rich, eat the oranges, find gold in the ground, and then 150 years after the gold rush, it's the most imprisoned people in the world. And I just thought, I've never been to a prison. Maybe I'll go see one. And <laughs> you thought at the time that California maybe had eight prisons or something like that? I did, yeah. And how many does California have? Uh, they have 33 state prisons and eight federal prisons and countless county jails. And, and did you go and paint every one of them? I painted every single state prison. I went to every single one, yeah. And what happened to the paintings? Did you sell them or are they somewhere? Uh, most of them are sold, yeah. It was a big exhibition. Uh, uh, it was called Prison Nation. And the lands beautiful landscape paintings of every prison in California. And, and um, when the Iraq War came, you painted a unique set of paintings where you kind of painted the Iraq War as if it had been painted by historic painters, is that right? Yeah. So how did you do that? Can you explain that process? It was a similar idea, looking at paintings of the past and sort of rethinking them. So I was looking at um, <coughs> French, uh, like 17, 1800 paintings of uh, like Algeria and their sort of over-romanticizing of, of Arabian themes and things. So I sort of switch that around and replace them with like American GIs. So when you're painting something and you say, well, I'm not sure if this is really working, do you call in somebody and say, what do you think of this? Or you never ask anybody's opinion when you're in the middle of a work? Uh, I wish I could call someone in, but you know, being a painter, mostly I just work all by myself and hope at the end it comes out all right. Maybe you don't <laughs> say to your wife, what do you think of this, honey? No, forget her. <laughs> <laughs> She's an artist as well. She's over doing her own stuff. <laughs> we'll look at it at the end, but not in the middle of the All process. Right, so what is your next big project? Oh, I don't know. I have a show up right now in San Francisco that was a big project. Uh, uh, it just opened last weekend, so I'm kind of on break. But that project was, uh, I watched the riots on January 6th when people were invading the U.S. Capitol, and the circular rotunda in the U.S. Capitol has eight paintings from U.S. history. So my project was to repaint all those eight paintings to be, m rather than white men conquering the world, it was more my choices of moments from American history. That's going to take a long time, isn't it? It's finished. It's finished. How long it's did it take you to do it? It took me, I started in January, it took nine months. Nine months. Well, that's pretty short for you. A painting a month, yeah. All right, so where is it now? It's up in San Francisco right now. Uh, on exhibition? Yeah. So, but it's it, for sale or not? Yeah, they're all for sale. Everything's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's called New Paintings for the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. But yeah. you, um, can you sell one or you have to buy all nine? No, you can buy one. I think they're flashing one up there. It's the uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence. Okay. And you see it's all, instead of the original painting, okay. it has. And why do you care so much about democracy? I, I'm worried about it. Because we have <laughs> too much democracy. I, I, I was never worried growing up, and now okay. I'm worried. You're worried. Yeah. Why do you care about democracy, Beth? Oh, because uh, because we might lose it. It's very it's in, more fragile than I. It feels like I should have known it was this fragile, and that surprise of it is that much more of uh, anxiety inducing. Incredibly fragile. It is. It is not guaranteed. Okay, so um, if you could do it all over again, would you um, change your art style and do something different or do a different type of art or you're pretty happy with the way you, you're unique and you're focused on historical kind of works of art that you now make in more modern form? No, I'm, I never thought I would be sitting here at Crystal Bridges talking about my work, so I'm, I'm very happy with how my life has okay. turned out. <laughs> <laughs> and same with you, 
uh, Bethany? It's going really well, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I'm enjoying the work that I'm making. Um, um, after the Odyssey series, I started working on a new series around the Aeneid and then performances from the hymnal. They feel very much reflective of this moment and helpful to me in like understanding the so world if now. If you could meet any living or not living artist, who would you like to meet? Uh, did you want to ask them first? <laughs> <laughs> you can meet any living or not living photographer, who would you like to meet? I would know them all. They're, uh, there's so many influences. Alvarez Bravo, uh, um, yeah. Dor Dor Dorothy uh, um, Lang. Lang uh, you know, there's so many artists, so many photographers who have influenced me. I've learned from all of them. I've studied them. That's what got me into photography, the history of photography. Uh, it's just There's so many of them. Uh, to be, as I said, with Gordon Parks in this exhibition, he became a mentor to me. When I would read Life magazine, Look magazine, and I'd study his work, he was a great influence in terms of that photographic eye of capturing that moment and storytelling. Because that image, when they say a picture has a thousand words, it is so true. It has even more than that. The backstory to those images is fascinating. So, um, we have time for some questions from audience, are they going to uh, come up by computer or some other electronic device? Have them here? Okay. All right. Questions are, how can we encourage young artists and creatives to explore bold themes that ignite their passion to create and become future change makers? An easy question. All right. Um, <laughs> any, any thoughts about that? How, How can you experience more? I don't know. I have two kids. We drag them to art museums every single day, and they hate it. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They're pretending to hate it. About that? How we can do that? I, we could fund arts education. I mean, yeah. <laughs> instead of cutting it first, uh, don't cut it right away. Actually. Okay. Any thoughts? Uh, well. The fact that this museum exists and doing what they're doing for the public in this area is a tremendous step. Cultural arts institutions are so important, whether they're local community, whether they're regional, or whether they're museum-wide, uh, it's so important to share. That's the growth process. To see all the children running around here, that's the beginnings. That's the, right. the beginning learning. Okay, um, please discuss the relationship between artist and subject or medium. How does the relationship evolve or define the outcome, compromises, or surprises? So the relationship between the artist and the subject of medium. Any mm. comment? Uh, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, the part that I didn't say about the hymnal is that I, uh, the other part of the hymnal is that I burned the musical notes out of it using a laser cutter. You can burn about 10 pages at a time without setting the book on fire. I would like to share this information if you're thinking about cutting a book. But the, that's intentional to the work because it means that, you know, the work falls apart. The more you turn the pages of the hymnal, um, the more you kind of participate in democracy, the messier it gets. But also, you know, it smells that burning of that kind of violence of the erasure of the music is embedded in the work. And... The burning, I'm, yeah, the musical notes, they're gone from the text. And so the thing that, that is supposed to hold the book together, that unifying melody is no longer there. All that you're left with is a hundred dissenting versions of what it means to be American, forever bound in the same text. So the material is intentional to the subject. Um, what was the question? The question is... Um, Let's say right now, discuss the relationship between the relationship between artist and the subject or medium. How does the relationship evolve or define the outcome? But you don't have to answer it. Uh, like a great answer. Okay. I'll, I'll accept the right answer. <laughs> all right. Let me uh, before we conclude. Let me talk about uh, some works of art that are in the form of documents that are here. Some I've lent, um, and I hope some of you have a chance to see it. Um, there's one of them that's there. It's the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is a very unique document. Um, it's really not a legal document. It's a, more or less a propaganda piece. Uh, and the, 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 the history of it was that at the 
uh, Second Continental Congress when there was a resolution to divide from uh, England, there wasn't the support yet, they hadn't been authorized yet, the delegates to the Second Continental Congress to actually vote to be freed uh, from England. So they, the resolution by John Adams and uh, William Randolph uh, to go back to the states and the states would go back and, and have their legislatures or special uh, meetings uh, authorize them to come back and vote to be independent. And that occurred um, in uh, the end of June of 1776. And while the delegates were leaving, um, it was decided that if they came back and they voted to be independent, we actually have to explain to the world why we're going to be independent. And so what happened was a committee was formed to actually come up with a PR document, propaganda document, whatever you want to call it. And they had five people on that, that committee. One was John Adams, who was leading the revolutionary effort. Uh, one was Benjamin Franklin, often thought to be the wisest man and the, and the most famous man, certainly in the country at the time. Um, third was a young man named Thomas Jefferson, 33 years old, who really didn't want to be there. His wife was ill, but he agreed to stay. And, uh, and then uh, two other men who are not as well known, Robert uh, Livingston and Roger Sherman. And they met, and ultimately John Adams said, to Thomas Jefferson, you should write the Declaration of Independence explaining this, because I'm very unpopular, people don't like me, and also, you know, Massachusetts is seen as the place that's trying to um, lead the revolution, and we should have somebody not from Massachusetts write it, and you're from Virginia. So Thomas Jefferson didn't really want to do it. He was not a man who was very a good, good public speaker, unlike John Adams. His entire time as President of the United States, he only made one public speech. He had a high-pitched voice, he didn't like to talk in public but he was a very good writer. So he said, okay, I'll take on the assignment. And like most humans, uh, he was given some time. He was given, I think, about 12 days to do this. He <laughs> waited for the last two days to do it. Uh, he was busy <laughs> doing other stuff. So he sat down, um, and with two slaves that were with him, he had owned during the course of his life two, 706 slaves. With those two slaves with him, um, he sat down and wrote more or less from memory, though he would say it was, wasn't original, but it was thoughts that had been circulating around the, the uh, colonies, and he wrote a sentence in there, uh, he wrote three parts to it, the preamble, the sins of King George, which was the essence of the document, all the things that King George had done that was bad, and then what we're going to do about it. What we're going to do about it was the big news, we're going to be independent. The sins of King George were um, rehashing of many things that people had accused King George of before, many of them were not really accurate and fair, and then the preamble. And the preamble was insignificant at the time, nobody paid attention to it. But it became uh, the most famous sentence, it contained the most famous sentence in the English language, subsequently. It is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, why did that become so famous? And why did people ignore it at the time? Well, at the time, people were not focused on the rhetoric, they were focused on the sins of King George and what we're going to do about it. And ultimately the delegates, when they came back, they voted on July the, 4th, or July the 4th to be independent. And at that time they sat down on July, they actually voted on July the 2nd. And on July the 2nd, July the 3rd, July the 4th, they actually debated this document that had been drafted by Thomas Jefferson. And they had uh, some 65 amendments to it, and Thomas Jefferson was sitting there and he was just dying because he he, he hated all the changes. He had written this thing, he thought it was wonderful, and they were sitting there making changes left and right, left and right. And Benjamin Franklin went over to him and said, look, don't worry, you know, don't take it uh, seriously, I'm an editor, people get edited, but <laughs> Thomas Jefferson hated it. In fact, he later wrote to his friends, here's the document that I wrote, and here's the document that these guys, these terrible people, mutilated my document. Don't you think mine's better? So ultimately, in fact, for nine years, he wouldn't admit to people that he had written the Declaration of Independence, because he thought it had been mutilated. Later, when it became more famous, he, he took some credit for it. In fact, as we all know, on his epitaph, he now says the first thing was author of the Declaration of Independence. But why did that first, that sentence become so famous? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Because in the end, that became the creed of America. Now, he was writing this at a time when he owned slaves, and when he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that, self that all men are created equal, he didn't really mean all and he really meant all white, privileged, Christian, property-owning men. But later, as people began to look at the words and not what he had intended at the time, the words were so strong that they began to be used in the civil rights movement, equal rights movement, and other efforts by people to gain uh, 
e equality, not only in the United States, but around the world. And those words became so famous because he wrote them hoping that maybe people would ultimately live up to what we, what we now tried to live up to. But at the time, he was honestly not saying that would be to get rid of slavery. But it, the, the, the words became the creed of our country because in the end, equality, equal protection, equal rights became the creed of our country. And that's why it became so famous. And in the end, uh, the document that you'll see um, here is actually a document that wasn't from 1776. I think there was one here. I don't know if it's still here now. But what happened is they went next door after they had agreed to the text, after the mutilation and all that, and they agreed to the text. And they went to a, Mr. a printer, Mr. Dunlop. And he printed up about 100 copies. And they sent one copy to King George, one copy to George Washington to read to the troops, one to each of the states. And they could see the text of what, what had been agreed to. It wasn't signed yet. And so they didn't, it wasn't signed that night because um, one of the states had, had been invaded by, New, by uh, the British, New York, and they couldn't get their legislature to agree to the, the, uh, the declaration, so they hadn't actually voted for it. So they wanted to have the states, all 13, all the colonies, come and agree to it. And later, about August, they, they, New York State was able to have its uh, state convention. And so in August, they, they brought the delegates back, and they signed the Declaration of Independence, and that's where you see the famous John Hancock signing, and he, it's very big because he said he wanted to make sure that King George saw it. And it was treason to do this, and they all recognized they probably could be hung or might be hung if uh, they ultimately lost the war, but they signed it. And, uh, and then the document was later released. That copy um, is now in the uh, National Archives, but it's faded beyond recognition because they put it in sunlight for many years, they didn't treat it well, and so forth. So as it was beginning to fade, John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State, the son of John Adams, said we ought to have perfect copies. And so, so people can actually see this before it fades. So they, they got a printer in Washington in 1823 to make a perfect copy. He made 200 of them, and there are about 30 of them left. And they are perfect copies. And so when you see in the New York Times on the 4th of July the copy of the Declaration of Independence, what you're seeing is called a stone copy, it's a stone with a printer. And that, what, that's what's in the exhibition here, a stone copy that's a, a, a perfect printing. They're not in perfect shape now because they're a couple hundred years old, they were folded up, and some of them had water damage and so forth. But what you're seeing in the exhibition is that. And the reason it's so important is while it's not a legal document, it kind of gave uh, voice to the words that later became the essence of what our country is supposed to be about, equal protection, equal rights. And it all really came from that one sentence that Thomas Jefferson wrote, not realizing at the time that it would become the most famous sentence in the English language, more than you wanted to know. Okay, so um, any other questions? Okay, well, I want to thank our panelists. And thank, yes, one question. Sorry? How fragile, do How fragile do I think our democracy is? More fragile than I'd like it to be. Um, there's, the truth is, uh, you know, as, as Winston Churchill famously said, uh, democracy is the worst form of government except every other one. And then uh, democracy is, is fragile right now for all the reasons that you know. But I, I do think that, uh, and I dedicated my uh, last book to uh, all the, the judges and federal civil servants who, who did the best to uphold the law and make certain that, that their democracy did survive. And so I do think we came close to um, some dangerous things. But I, I think it's fragile, but I, I don't think it's going away. It's just it's a bit fragile. We, we need to do more to kind of remind people what it's all about and why democracy is the best form of government. Okay? Thank you all very much. Thank you.